Good afternoon, and Greg, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying uh, that it is a pleasure to be here to moderate the next two panels, uh, the Community Perspectives and the Community Benefits Panel. And also to begin by uh, acknowledging that we are on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, and to thank them for welcoming our ancestors to their land and helping us adapt to our new world. Now, to set the stage for this discussion, I want to provide a bit of background about the development of Northern British Columbia. I do this because the trajectory and momentum of history of British Columbia can help us understand where we are today. I'm going to go back to just after World War II. At that time, the North and the interior of British Columbia were largely undeveloped. There were very few roads, very few rail lines, and industry, such as it was, was small and generally supplied local markets. In 1952, BC elected a government led by Premier W.A.C. Bennett. Premier Bennett had a tremendous vision for British Columbia. He saw an opportunity post-World War II in the growth of communities and industry in North America driven by the returning veterans coming home from the war, as well as the reconstruction of Europe. He saw BC as a supplier of resources and raw materials to fuel that growth. So Premier Bennett embarked on an ambitious program to open up the North and the interior. He worked with industry, mainly forestry at the time, attracting investment and creating jobs. He built road and rail systems so that industry could get their goods to market, a global market. He built dams to provide the electricity to power the industry, and he built communities. Communities, hospitals, schools, arenas, swimming pools, all places that would attract and retain workers that industry needed. Some, like Kitimat and Mackenzie, were completely new, hewn out of the forest, instant towns. In other places, existing communities were expanded. Premier Bennett employed a coordinated and integrated approach to public and private sector investment. That coordinated approach was responsible for the long economic boom that this province enjoyed from the 1950s to about 1980. It was enormously successful. In fact, over those three decades, every region in the province gained population in every census period. It was an amazingly productive time and an amazingly successful period of province building. And at its heart was this coordinated approach to public and private sector investment. Then came the recession of the early 80s and everything changed. Global markets, increased competition, and price instability radically changed things for northern BC's communities. We went from this map of solid growth for three decades to this. Communities and regions across the North lost population. Jobs were lost. Youth moved away to larger cities. Services were lost. Houses sat empty. It was a very difficult time. Since 2001, and despite the 2008 recession, Things have been improving for communities in the North. And today, as we have heard throughout this conversation, we are on the cusp of the most significant transformation of economies and communities since the 1950s, that great era of province boom, uh, building and that, the era that created the last long boom. It is a time of great opportunity a time to create that next long boom. It is a generational opportunity, but it will not be without its challenges. We have on stage a panel of individuals who will share with us their perspectives and experience regarding both the opportunities and the challenges um, facing northern communities. I'd like to introduce you to them now. 
First, we have John Farrell, who is the president of the Prince Rupert and District Chamber of Commerce. Uh, John has worked for the last 20 years in community development on the North Coast and on Haida Gwaii. He is president of the Prince Rupert and District Chamber of Commerce, which was last year's recipient of the BC Chamber of the Year Award. He is a small business owner himself and general manager of the Community Futures Development Corporation of the Pacific Northwest, which is a leader in both small business and economic community development. He serves on a number of local and provincial boards. Prince Rupert, Port Edward, along with the outlying First Nation villages are experiencing unprecedented interest from numerous global energy companies that could transform the region into a global leader in natural gas exportation. In his roles with both the Chamber of Commerce and Community Futures, John is leading his teams in preparing the communities for sudden growth while ensuring there will be a lasting generational leg legacy. Our second panelist is Janine North, and Janine is the Chief Executive Officer of the Northern Development Initiatives Trust. Janine serves um, as, as the CEO uh, with, a, with a $220 million regional economic trust corporation that builds a stronger north through sustainably funding community and business development initiatives across 70% of British Columbia. Ms. North is also a director on the BC Hydro and Power Authority and a governor of the Business Council of British Columbia, as well as a director for both the Canadian Sport Institute and Via Sport. Our third panelist is Rona Martin, who is the president and executive chair of the Uni Union of British Columbia Municipalities. Director Rona Martin is serving her eighth term as an EA director on the Columbia Shoe Schwab Regional District, where she was chair for six years. She has also been UBC on the UBCM board since 2006 and is a past president of the Southern Interior Local Government Association. During her service on the UBCM executive, Director Martin has been involved in several committees and groups, including being chair of the Environment Committee and a member of the President's Committee. Director Martin is involved in community issues, has been involved in community issues since the early 1980s and is currently chair of the uh, North Okanagan Shushwap Regional Hospital District, chair of the Southern Interior Beetle Action uh, Committee, and a director on the Eagle Valley Senior Citizens Home. Housing Society, pardon me. Rona was raised in Kitimat and moved to Malakwa in her late teens. She and her partner, Brian, have owned and operated a family restaurant there for over 25 years. Rona has five children, one daughter and four sons, 17 grandchildren, and two great-granddaughters. Our next uh, panelist is Alexander Piestrella. Uh, who is uh, the regional business uh, 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 coordinator for Northern BC of, with Hatch and Hatch Mott McDonald. As the uh, regional business uh, development and community coordinator for Northern BC, um, he, he, he takes on a wide range of roles. With a degree in chemical engineering, Alex brings years of international experience in project management, business development, and client engagement from his work in the automotive industry. Alex coordinates outreach and business development activities from the, from the new Hatch and HMM office in Terrace, BC, focusing on First Nations engagement and community impact assessments. He was also a provincial appointee until April 2014, Northwest Region, with the Board of Northern Development Initiative Trust and an active volunteer on other public and not-for-profit organizations. And finally, this brings me to Lucy Pratt, who is the Community and Business Development Liaison at Alice Dawn Industrial Services. With a background in community and stakeholder engagement, 
Lucy's experience on the front lines of economic and energy development in Northwestern BC have given her valuable insight into the coordination and execution of strategic and creative communications initiatives. A passion for her community and the best outcomes of individuals have resulted in successful deliverables in energy literacy, capacity development, and community engagement. Would you please welcome our panelists this afternoon? Now our format is going to be each one of our panelists are going to give some introductory remarks and we'll have them follow that with questions and discussion. So I'm going to turn to John to start us off. John. Thanks, Marlene. So the question before the panel is, how do communities respond to LNG? In Prince Rupert's case, I think it's both with excitement and trepidation. For the past 20 years, um, we've been looking in the rear view at the past uh, when forestry and fishing were industries on the coast. And I think in, since that time, we've been, fair to say, struggling our way through. Um, I know that for the, several of those years, I ran a restaurant and, and it has been tough. But I've been um, among a small circle of believers that the work that the port has been doing aggressively, um, seeking markets in Asia, our proximity to Asia, um, all of those things put together mean a strong future. And, and I think if we carry forward, then we're going, to, uh, we're going to have the day where we really are the next great port city. So my reasons for optimism uh, were given flight when, uh, <laughs> when we had the, uh, the first shovel in the ground at the $90 million road rail and utility corridor on Ridley Island, which is home to the to the coal and grain terminals. And it really did open the door to a whole window of other opportunities in industrial development. And I think ones that will, um, for the decades to come, provide a really bright future for Prince Rupert. Um, in terms of LNG, there's been lots of activity. There's been activity um, in construction of the upcoming camps, and there's been uh, activity around uh, EA and, uh, and uh, final investment decision. But for growth, as opposed to activity, I look uh, at our main street, Third Avenue. So for the past several years, actually decades, uh, we jokingly refer to it as um, a toothless smile because every third storefront is vacant. And we're starting to see those vacancies filled up. We're starting to see offices. We're starting to see retail come back. And, uh, and that gives us room to breathe and room for optimism. Um, and Amongst that, too, we've seen, uh, like just in the last, um, I'd say the last, well, since January, we've had 50 new business licenses. A quarter of those are contractors and construction firms, and uh, the balance is professional services attached to LNG. So we're seeing more, more of the world coming to our door, and the good news is that we're also seeing um, startups like we've not seen before. So. In the past 11 months, we've seen five new restaurants start up. We've seen uh, an excellent microbrewery. They can't even keep their beers on the shelves. We've seen uh, new gyms, uh, a couple of yoga studios, and that's just a partial list of the, the new startups that we're seeing. And that's important because I think that the promise of LNG and the work that the port's been doing um, has really started a new generation of entrepreneurs that are ready to take the risk. Um, and of course, with every opportunity, there are its challenges. And I think a lot of other people uh, in the community um, prescribe to the Big Bang theory of development where we'll wait until FID, we want to see something tangible, and then we're all in, which as we know is not a winning strategy. It's been, we've seen it in other jurisdictions and it hasn't worked. So I think there's a difference in philosophy. The business or the, the proponents are in a dash to FID. And for the communities, and I'd like the industry to see it, we, we really do see it as a relay. And in order for that to relay to work, in order for us to be successful, then we have to have all of those partners involved. So that means both levels of government, local and provincial, and that means the business community, that means the NGOs, and that means, uh, and that means all industry, as well as First Nations, because as you know, um, those negotiations, those conversations are happening in different rooms. And if we're going to succeed as a community, we need it to be in the same room. So I think it's a two-way street. 
we can benefit industry as community by mitigating the risk for development. We can talk about the infrastructure shortfalls, we can talk about capacity issues, and we can work towards a solution in that. But what we need is we need information. Right now, I have lots of business people coming into my office, and they want to know what the opportunities are. And quite frankly, we don't have a lot to give them. So we need that information. We need the, 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 uh, the companies to pull those cards off their chest a little. I understand the due diligence that goes into uh, preparing for FID, but we need to know what those opportunities are for us to be successful. Because in the long run, right, we have a lot at stake here. We have a, we have a long-term uh, uh, bid for the success of our, of our town. We want to see the quality of life continue at the high level it is right now. And to do that, I think we need partnerships to develop that road towards Prince Rupert as the next great port city. So thank you. Thanks, John. Janine. John, I'd echo your um, focus on needing information and add to that collaboration. Um, as somebody who uh, stewards resources uh, for 49 local governments and 88 First Nations and the societies and the business in the North, who are all focused on building a stronger North, um, we have programs that help them uh, with everything from 14 airport expansions over the last uh, few years to uh, the other amenities and diversifying pieces that build quality of life in communities and help businesses prepare for a more robust, a stronger supply chain and being able to take advantage of revenue opportunities. In terms of the businesses, if you look at supplychainconnector.ca, you'll find over 2,000 businesses in central and northern BC that are putting themselves forward and growing in order to uh, serve, whether it's mining forestry or the, uh, the promise of LNG. But information about what are the certifications, the qualifications that are required, um, what is likely to be uh, procured locally, regionally, and how do businesses, whether they are based in Fort Nelson, uh, 100 Mile House, the Northwest um, communities or along the Highway 16 corridor participate in that growth of the region. That's what they want to know. Um, our organization, Northern Development, does business boot camps, uh, helps businesses in terms of responding <coughs> to procurement opportunities, um, and provides the, some of the consulting expertise to help those businesses grow, develop, and become more competitive. Uh, as they uh, do this relay um, to uh, strive in terms of growing the jobs, the opportunities, and the revenues that make it a stronger, more diverse economy that attracts people in to stay, not just a fly-out, fly-in economy, um, and reverses those trends that you saw in Marlene's slide. Thanks so much, Janine. Yeah. Thanks, Marlene, and uh, thank you for the invitation to represent UBCM here today to talk about the community perspectives. So by way of background, um, the Union of BC Municipalities is the association that represents and acts as an advocate for all local governments in BC, both rural and urban communities, large and small from all regions. We do have some First Nations communities that are members of our organization as well. Uh, they voluntarily join our association. The interests and needs of our members are as diverse as our provincial geography, but all of our members recognize we are entering a time of great change, challenge, and opportunity as the LNG sector establishes itself in BC. As we look to the economic opportunities that lie before us, it is important to draw on the lessons learned from the past. For over 20 years, I have served as a local elected official representing a rural resource-dependent community. Our community depends on the jobs, tax revenues, and other economic activity that comes from, a, about from the resource sector. When times are good, the community benefits as a whole, but when global markets change, the economic and social impacts are felt by everyone in the community. The cyclical nature of our resource dependent or development has played out at some time in the majority of BC communities. As elected officials, we look for ways to buffer those impacts to protect our communities. 
This has resulted in the adoption of numerous poly policy positions that have sought a greater role for local governments in determining how resources are managed within their region, have sought stronger relationships with the provincial government and industry sectors, and have sought access to other re revenue sources in recognition of the services provided by local government to support economic development. These policy positions speak to the approach our membership would like to take as we embrace future economic development opportunities, whether LNG or other investments. Communities first and foremost want to work in partnership. By working in partnership, the provincial government, industry and local government will be well positioned to support the development of the LNG sector. In 2013, UBCM members signaled their support for expanding BC's economic advantage with the adoption of our Strong Fiscal Futures Report. The report speaks to local government's priority to partner with the province to improve the economy and begin the dialogue towards fairer, more responsive revenue tools. The province has clearly identified development of the LNG sector as its economic priority. Communities recognize the importance of working in partnership with the provincial government and industry to ensure that this economic priority becomes a reality. At the foundation of that partnership are three critical elements, communication, consultation, and respect. Early and ongoing communication between the partners ensures that there are no information gaps. All parties must understand the steps necessary to move through the economic development process. That being said, local governments are on the front line and should be one of the first points of contact for any project proponent. In short, we know our communities best. Likewise, early and ongoing consultation between the parties is just as important. Major industrial development takes time. Throughout the various stages of development, frequent check-ins are necessary to ensure projects remain on track. Similarly, opportunities for input at key points within the decision-making process are critical for project success. And finally, respecting each other's roles and responsibilities is paramount. While most of you likely have a good understanding of the role of the provincial government, my sense is that understanding does not extend to BC local government and how it fits into the bigger picture of major industrial development. Local governments are service providers. Local elected officials are responsible for ensuring that the infrastructure requirements of their community are planned and provided for well in advance of projected need. Infrastructure projects require a significant capital investment and need to be incorporated incorporated into annual and long-term planning and budgetary cycles. In times of rapid growth and development, this can be extremely challenging for local governments. And as community leaders, we think industry is best served when local governments have the capacity and resources to respond in a timely manner. While major industrial projects like LNG require extensive local government staff resources, this is only the tip of the iceberg it is not just the LNG project itself, but all of the other services and infrastructure demands that accompany that development that challenge the limited resources in some communities. The community of Kitimat is a good example to showcase my point. Kitimat is a small resource-based community of about 10,000 residents. Like other communities of its size, Kitimat welcomes the opportunity to diversify and expand its economic development potential. The challenge, however, is how to keep up with the rapid rate of growth and development that is presently happening. For instance, in addition to LNG project proponents, the local government is also working with hundreds of other developers, investors, and service sector representatives that are exploring their own economic development opportunities. In response, the municipality has hired 10 additional staff to deal with the workload. These costs are borne solely by the local government through the local taxpayer. No financial support is provided to the local government at this point. However, through its Strong Fiscal Futures Report, UBCM is looking to engage the province in a dialogue towards securing fairer and more responsive revenue tools. The impacts of rapid growth and development on Kitabat are staggering. Over 10,000 construct construction jobs are expected. 
costs for rental housing have tripled, 0% vacancy, 1,800 workers are presently housed in a work camp with another 500 housed on a dock cruise ship, ongoing redevelopment of existing housing stock to support new residents and workers, ensuring water and sewer services are able to support this rapid rate of expansion and development, traffic congestion, expansion within the hospitality and commercial service sector, a new 2,100 bed lodge is being built for workers within municipal boundaries. And please keep in mind, Kitimat's population is presently about 10,000 people. The transformation and change within Kitimat continues to ramp up as new investors are drawn to the community. The purpose of this panel was to dis discuss how communities are responding to the LNG investment in BC. I would suggest that communities are responding as best as they can with the limited staff capacities and resources they possess. Our members recognize the unique opportunity that has presented itself and seek to take advantage of the economic development potential that exists. However, to do so in the most effective and efficient manner, local governments need to work in partnership <coughs> with the provincial government and industry. It is only through early and ongoing communication and consultation respect for each other's roles and responsibilities that our economic goals will become a reality. Thank you. Thanks, Rona. <laughs> Alex. I would like to draw um, a comparison before I start, and it's basically a bit of a story. Um, I landed in Canada on August 2nd, 2009, and I uh, come from Germany, which is a country half the size of British Columbia with 82 million people in it. So you can imagine that community development in that part of the world looks a little bit different than it does in Canada. And I was wondering how community development really works in a country, second largest country in the world with roughly 34, 5 million people. So when I, um, when I landed in, uh, in Terrace on uh, August 2nd, 2009, I uh, very quickly realized that, that the integrity of the place and the integrity of the community very much depends on the people that live in the community. So I am um, about six weeks into, about eight weeks into uh, being in Terrace, I uh, proposed a Christmas market idea to, um, to the city council and, uh, and mayor, um, because it was something that was close to my heart. This is part of our culture. This is what we do back home close to Christmas to get everybody into the spirit of, uh, of, the, of the festive season. And um, I was almost shocked to uh, see and realize that I was given some money and, and support by city staff to do that. And this is a, an amazing experience when you come from a different country and you're well, that well received and, 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 and uh, that readily accepted. Um, and it's really a story about, about giving. I wanted to come here and give something of my knowledge, of my education, of my background, of where I come from. Uh, we all have our own roots, we all have our own cultures and education, and I wanted to bring that and apply that. And we very specifically as a family, we wanted to go to, to rural uh, British Columbia. Um, our son is now eight, he was three at the time when we moved, and we loved the idea of a small community for, for, uh, for family and to raise a family. And then, through the time and uh, through, the, through the years now, I've been here for almost five years, I really fell in love not only with the city of Terrace, but with the entire region. The entire region has enormous integrity, and like any place, has enormous integrity. So when I go through the region and through the communities, um, I see large expectations and a lot of hope. I mean, you heard Marlene talk about the hard times, the economic times that, that, that were uh, that the North has experienced. And the last two or three years have really changed. Um, city of Terrace predominantly, I would say, but also the city, uh, district of Kitimat and, and Prince Rupert as well, uh, through the decision by Rio Tinto Alcan to modernize the smelter, uh, through the decision to build the Northwest Transmission Line and, uh, and a few other smaller projects. Um, it has generated a sense of hope and uh, investments are coming into the community. Um, and uh, more houses are being built right now. Um, 
But I would also like to, 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 to before I leave over to, to, to Lucy, I would like to leave the, the, the key message, I think, also for industry, when they come into the region and, and, and when they make their final investment decisions at the end of the day, that to build community and to build healthy community, you will have to live in the community. You will need to understand the community and you will need to find staff and people that really are dedicated to the area and, and to the life of the community and, and to the volunteering. Um, I volunteer a fair amount in the community because I love to do it. I receive great, um, uh, it, it's an honor for me to do that. And, and I have realized that these smaller communities in BC really are dependent on, on volunteer work when it comes to sports events. May this be ice hockey. Or, or soccer in the summer, people need coaches, etc., etc. So I think the integrity of the place is important to be kept alive, to take away from the fear that people might have for the change that's going to come. And I think the best way to do that, or some of the aspects to doing that, is um, that the new people that are coming to town are really moving to town and are understanding uh, the, the communities and are active in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And Lucy. So Alex, you know that I can run wild with that topic all day. Um, so I just want to give a bit of background about myself and, and echo some of the comments we've heard on stage here today. So Northwest British Columbia has experienced, I would say, a good decade, if not more, of truly, truly hard times. And um, you know, I'm going to use some parallels in my own life, if I can, just like Alex. So five years ago, I owned a retail store in Terrace called Outspoken Bike and Sport. And when Eurocan closed, um, I was financially devastated and I had to hand the keys into my business and I had to hand the keys into my home. And that was common in Kitimat. And what I had to do is I had to assess the skills that I had that were transferable as industry was coming to Terrace and what did I need to do so that I could stay living here locally. And at that time is when I realized that the only way forward was an education. And that's when I became so incredibly passionate about realizing that our young people also need an education to be at the table. And um, just to share, for those that don't know in the room, this week some of us from Northwest BC brought 100 kids down to the, Northwest, or to the BC LNG conference. Um, and I, I definitely need to say thank you to the Ministry of Natural Gas Development and Jennifer Ray if she's in the room, because without your help, it wouldn't happen. One of, the, one of the opportunities we had to do is, or we had the privilege of doing, is working together with industry to share that this is real and this is coming. And to really excite and ignite kids in knowing that their future is bright right here at home. And what are the advantages that we have in British Columbia? We have a location and we have energy. And we need to share that energy with the rest of the world and this is the path forward. And so those kids were able to be exposed to the University of British Columbia. They were exposed to the trade show and to many of you downstairs. Um, and I've already had positive feedback from the teachers today saying that kids are making plans with counselors for their careers ahead. And so I want to encourage you in the room to know that you have some great advocates in Northwest British Columbia. And as Alex said, the importance of really integrating yourself in the community and making yourself local because we look forward to seeing you at the farmer's market <laughs> and we look forward to seeing you at our school, at our, at our, at our son's um, soccer games and hockey games. Um, but it's what it's going to take to do business in Northwest British Columbia because much like our First Nations neighbors that spoke before us, it is a relationship that's based on openness, transparency, trust, communication and collaboration. And uh, we, we all love BC and we look forward to the opportunity to show you why we love to live, work and play um, in the Northwest. But you know, it's exciting times to know that we do have some challenges with the growth ahead of us. There are challenges we're rolling up our sleeves to help you overcome. Um, you know, and it's nothing but exciting from here. So thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you all. Um, all of you have uh, definitely in your marks, remarks spoken about the commitment to community that is so important. And you all have also spoken about the importance of partnerships uh, in all of the LNG development. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit about what a successful partnership would look like from your perspective as you move forward. John, would you like to start? Sure. So, I mean, if you look at, at the membership of the Chamber of Commerce and you look down the list of directors, you'll see uh, three 
three of the directors that uh, are uh, employed by uh, two of the LNG companies. Um, and those, those directors have been with the chamber for uh, a number of years, so it was pre, they, they got involved in the chamber pre-employment. But it shows the, the value of, of and, and, the, and, the, and the smart thinking of uh, the proponents to make sure that they're hiring those people locally that actually have already developed relationships um, with, uh, with the stakeholders and, uh, and the leadership uh, elected and otherwise in our community. And, uh, and that's, that's really the, 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 the first start, I think, in terms of creating those partnerships, which is really a, a fancy word for relationship. And so I know that already, right now, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, we're trying to get um, a visioning workshop uh, put together um, uh, with the elected leaders from both Port Edward and Prince Rupert and, uh, and key stakeholders in the business community to really talk about some of the issues that we already have, the challenges that we know that we have from transportation to traffic flow to some of the, some of the major key issues that will actually, um, that are standing in the way partially of development. And uh, so the fact that we already have those, those people that are, that are uh, in our community that, uh, that are working for uh, the proponents means that we can find easy solutions. And, and I know the BG Group uh, stepped forward and uh, found us an excellent facilitator in, uh, in uh, ex-Premier Mike Hardcourt to come up and, and, uh, and help us through that uh, conversation. And um, so those are, I guess, you know, I'm taking a little bit of a song sheet uh, or a page out of Alex's uh, song sheet there, but, uh, or song book, but uh, I think that's really the start because we need to develop those relationships. And we have a, we have a fast time frame, so we've got to develop those relationships uh, fast, but I think uh, I think that's the way we're going to um, move ahead together. Great. We don't have a lot of time left, but would we like to go on, Janine? Let me talk about a couple of the elements of a great partnership. Um, first, it, it has to address a need. Um, it has to be respectful. Uh, best partnerships are local, when you can look somebody in the eyes. Um, and it's well resourced with people and with the finances to um, get an output, meet the need. So if I look at some of the partnerships in the North, and one example might be the Northern Development Initiative Trust with 49 local governments and all working together, the First Nations societies and business to build a stronger North. But another might be the Northwest Readiness Project that um, this province entered into just last week to help communities in the Northwest plan to be ready for a future, plan to respond proactively uh, to development and get their asset inventories uh, well established so that they would be able to respond to uh, um, Build Canada funding or federal provincial funding. As well, there's partnerships in the Northeast that are very effective. I think the Northeast and the Northwest are probably our two strongest regions in terms of partnerships fair share agreement, other agreements, but it takes those elements that I talked about. Great, thanks Janine. Ona, did you? I just think that um, communication is key, ongoing communication and cons consulting with everyone. Um, and people need to remember that, uh, that there is three or four sometimes uh, people or, or groups that need to be in the room at the same time. Um, also, as I'm an electoral area director, I will put on a, a hat for electoral area directors. Municipalities, people recognize the mayor and the council, but quite often they don't realize that the impacts that something's going to uh, create in the electoral area, and uh, some of the rural people feel very threatened when they don't feel that their voice is being heard. So it, it is just good to be communicating with everybody, and I think that that saves a lot of problems at the end of the day. Great. We have about a minute and 33 seconds left. That's what's in the Yes, process. exactly. So I'm just going to do this very quickly. I think, uh, I think um, leading into a partnership, I think a good starting point would be to not think about what's in it for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because if you come from that angle and that framework and that mindset, uh, you're going to be, you're going you're gonna to come across as honest. And, um, and, and lead your partnership uh, and the will for that by asking questions rather than going in and providing answers. Great. Lucy. Yeah, just to finish, I will um, 
exactly mirror what Alex just said. You know, it comes down to authenticity. And I really believe that leadership is in listening. And when we come with the approach of wanting to learn about a community and want to learn what challenges are, then that's when we can find solutions instead of you know, offering solutions um, that may or may not work. So again, I, I just repeat, you know, it's all about relationships, right? And it's that openness, that, that tra transparency, um, and again, being present. So finding the time and recognizing that it will take the time to be together, to learn together, to explore together the, 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 the opportunities, um, to plan forward together rather than coming up with solutions, um, build collaborations almost before we build partnerships, and recognizing that all of this needs support. So some very wise advice from our very first community panel. Uh, thank you all very much for being here today, and please, let's give them another hand.